open your Bibles to Leviticus. I'll be there in a few moments. But first, I want to read you something concerning the tabernacle. I've been preaching on the tabernacle. Briefly going through the different locations and pieces of furniture that's found in the tabernacle. It's not a complete teaching on the tabernacle. So I'll leave it open in the future to add more insight on the topics I already taught on in this series. But the first go through this series, I just want to briefly cover some things concerning the tabernacle, which all points to Jesus Christ, by the way. In Hebrews 9, verses 8 and 9, talks about <clears throat> which was a figure for the time then present. You can read the verses in your own Bible study. But the Holy Spirit's own testimony and witnesses witness that the tabernacle in the wilderness was a figure of something future. Something future. Something that was yet to come. Now we, in 2023, already received seen what was what came and that was Jesus and the tabernacle is testimony and a witness that was in the wilderness which point to a future someone and of course that was Jesus Christ the word figure means type or shadow and so we are reminded that this tabernacle was only a shadow of something greater which still laid in the future. And here it is. And in Hebrews 9, 11 through 14, it reads, But Christ being come as a an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption, redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the, and the ashes of an heifer sprinkled the unclean, sanctified the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That's Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. Christ, therefore, is the original tabernacle, eternal in the heavens. The tabernacle in the wilderness was a figure and a shadow of him who was still to come. The altar speaks of him on the cross. The laver speaks of him as the eternal word. And the table of showbread as Christ, the bread of life. The lamp as Christ, the light of the world. The incense altar, altar speaks of our interceding high priest. The ark speaks of a supreme authority and kingly position and finished work. The wood in the tabernacle points to his humanity. The gold to his deity. The silver to his blood. The brass to his perfect holiness. Purple speaks of his royalty. White of his righteousness. Scarlet of his sacrifice and his blood. The veil points to his body, which must be rent to give access to God. And so we might go on, and so we might go on and on, for we believe that every single part and every detail in this tabernacle is some way prefigured and foreshadowed some aspect of the infinite work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I totally agree, except I would add, as far as the silver goes, it also means redemption, but I agree. It all points to Christ. That's why it's important to see all the different pieces and understand what they symbolize. <clears throat> you could put on the screen. Well, let's know. First, let's go to Leviticus chapter 16, 14, because that's when we start concerning the mercy seat. Leviticus chapter 16, Verse 14, he, that's Aaron, 
shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle, sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. And before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some blood with his finger seven times. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, also known as Yom Kippur, the high priest of Israel would enter into the Holy Holies to offer the instructed way of offering it, the prescribed sacrifice to God. Put it on the screen. <clears throat> We came through the gate, the brazen altar. We came into the holy place. The veil is right there. And then you have the ark. And on top of the ark, the mercy seat sat. And this whole location was called the Holy of Holies. And once a year, the high priest would enter in through the veil to present the sacrifice. If he did it right, and if it was accepted by God, the people's sins would be covered for one year or the next 12 months. Now, inside this ark, right there, I don't know why I'm not able to write on it, but they'll come in here and figure it out. But inside this ark laid contents. Three separate things was in the ark. By design, I'll just write it here in the bottom. One, the Ten Commandments that were carved on stone, by the way, sapphire stone, and I'll have to teach a message on that one day. So that was one of the items that you would find inside the ark right here. What was the second item that was found in the ark? A golden bowl that contained manna. I'm running out of room here. I'll write it up here. A golden bowl that contained manna. And the third thing, I'll just put it right here, that number three, Aaron's rod that budded. Aaron's rod that budded. So you found the Ten Commandments, Carved in stone, sapphire stone, a golden bowl which contained manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, or which budded. Now, <clears throat> back to the Holy of Holies, back to the ark. The high priest would come through the veil and sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice seven times seven times right there in front of the mercy seat in front of the mercy seat he would only sprinkle by the way of the seven times let me backtrack here he sprinkled the blood of the sacrifice seven times in front of the mercy seat, but only once on top. The top covering 
which held all these three things that I just mentioned that were in the inside of that ark. Now, why is that? Why the high priest sprinkled the blood of the sacrifice seven times in front of the mercy seat, but only once on top? The top covering, the covering that was covering these three items that we find in the tabernacle. Now, only one drop depicts Jesus' blood. That's the reason why only one drop or one sprinkle was needed on top of the mercy seat, the covering. But why seven in front? It makes you wonder, right? Why seven in front? Now, you go to Job chapter 1, you can read this on your own. I've preached on this before. In Job chapter 1, I'll just write it here, Job chapter 1, verse 6. <clears throat> You'll read a story. In Job chapter 1, verse 6, it says that one day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. Satan also came among them. Why Satan? What in the heck is Satan doing there? He came along with all the good other heavenly beings and he presented himself to God. Now, Satan's evil. No question about that. And because he's evil, the place where he presented himself to God, the place where he stood was defiled. And then that raises another question. Why was he even allowed to be there in the first place? Why was Satan allowed to be in the presence of God with the other heavenly beings that were also presenting themselves? Well, <clears throat> because that was the spot that belonged to Adam. Adam forfeited his place. The place where he would bow down to his knee, bowed, he bowed, bowed down his knee with all the other beings. But he forfeited that place when he sinned. And guess who took his place? The rebel, outlaw, evil Satan. Anyone that reads scripture and studies the scriptures, know that numbers have meanings in the scriptures. Seven is particularly significant. The Holy Spirit, I believe, through the writers that he used, includes them to add meaning to the text that's important to God. Seven is the number of completeness or perfection. Let's write that down. Seven equals completeness or perfection. Sprinkling blood seven times covered and sanctified the place in front of the altar so that the priest could come before a holy God with his sins perfectly covered under the old covenant. Now, if you caught it, I said covered. I didn't say cleansed. I said covered. Their sins were covered in the Old Testament. They weren't cleansed. But when Jesus comes along and he offered his perfect unblemished, sinless 
blood. He sprinkled his precious blood in the front of the throne of God and sat down on the mercy seat, which means that he cleansed our sins for all time. One offering for all time. Not only cleansed our sins for all time, as well as that place where the devil had stood or been allowed to stand was important. Why? Because he can no longer come before the throne of God and accuse us. Period. Unlike what many preachers preach, Satan's not up, not up there right now accusing us. He can't in 2023. In fact, he's not been able to do that for the last 2,000 years. Why? Because Jesus' is blood. Jesus' blood. Now, back to these three items. Why was these three items important? And why are these three items inside the ark with a covering? That's the question. Well, they represent the entire scope of man's rejection. You look at the first one. Ten Commandments, etched in stone, sapphire stone. Man was in rebellion and rejection, one of God's law. That was represented by these stone tablets. Number two, the manna in the golden bowl is a rejection of God's provision. That's what's represented by this golden bowl of manna. And number three is rejection of God appointed leadership, which is represented by Aaron's rod. The rod, by the way, that budded. Now, you could write this down in Exodus 16 and 17. You could read it some other time. If you remember, or if you're not familiar with the story, the people, these Israelites were complaining about Aaron being appointed as their leader. So what did God do? He instructed Moses to collect from all 12 tribes, they were tribal leaders, collect all these tribal leaders' rods. A rod was a symbol of leadership that they carried. The name of each tribal head was inscribed on their respective rod for identification purposes. And all these rods were placed in front of the mercy seat before the Lord. You know, you go to Exodus 17, verse 8. I'm just going to go there real quick. You can go there if you want. It reads, Now it came to pass in the next day, that Moses went into the tabernacle witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron, of the house of Levi, had sprouted and put forth buds, had produced blossoms and yield ripe almonds. Verse 9, Then Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord to all the children of Israel, and they looked, and each man took his rod. Everything that represented man's rejection and rebellion against God. He wanted to put under the mercy seat so they can be covered by the blood that was sprinkled on top every year. You know, when you read a story about Balak, 
Also, you can find that in the Old Testament in Numbers 23. When Balak hired Balaam, Balaam was kind of like a wizard, if you want to call it that. God called him to say to the king, which was Balak, in Numbers 23, let's just go to it real quick. At least I'll go to it. He, the Lord, had not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen, he being the Lord, by the way, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. Why is that? Why is that? I want you to take notice in this verse that God did not say there was no iniquity in Israel, but that he does not see iniquity in Israel. Here's God's mercy in display once again, even in the Old Testament. Why did he not see iniquity? Because if you follow the principles that I'm laying down, that God's word already laid down way before me, I'm just reiterating it to you, is because it was covered by the blood of their sacrifices offered continually, which reminded him of his beloved son. And the sacrifice that he would offer in the future. That's the way God designed it. That's what he wanted. God did not want to deal with them according to their sins. Even back in the Old Testament. I repeat, he did not want to deal with them according to their sins. He wanted to deal with them according to his mercy. Nothing has changed. It still operates the same way. Now through his son. He doesn't want to deal with us according to our sins. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, folks. Now we are blessed because we live under a new covenant. We don't have to deal with all that sacrificing. And there was a lot of sacrifices and a lot of blood that came along with it. We don't have to deal with any of that. Why? Because our great heart, high priest Jesus, the anointed Son of God, priest lives, and his blood is at the heavenly mercy seat that not just covers our sins, not just cleanses our sins, but removes our sins. He atoned for our sins in his own body once and for all time. Christ is our mercy seat, friends. So what do you do when you teach the law? What do you do when you teach the Ten Commandments and all the other laws and regulations? Over 600 of them. Now, I don't think you get too many, too many arguments that says that Jesus is not our mercy seat. I believe they all agree that Jesus is our mercy seat. If Jesus is our mercy seat, then why do you even bother teaching the law? Why do you even bother with the Ten Commandments? Because let me tell you, friends, when you do that, you have now pushed aside the mercy seat. What am I saying? You have pushed Jesus out of the way. You have pushed Jesus aside. 
what you've done is taking the you taken the tablets out from underneath the mercy seat and by the way that's where God wants them whether you like that or not or whether you agree with that or not you're not God he's the boss and that's what he chose Moses to instruct Aaron to place those tablets of commandments in that ark underneath the mercy seat because that's where God wants them hidden let me tell you and I don't really think I've ever said this maybe I have I've said a lot of things in 18 years so some things I can forget if I said them or not when you take these tablets out of the ark and, and remove that cover, you do it at great peril. You do it at your own risk. Not just taking them out, but teaching them. But teaching them. Why were the tablets under the mercy seat? So when God looked down at this ark, he would see only the blood and not our rebellion. And just in case you think you should take them out of the ark by first removing the mercy seat cover and then taking them out of the ark, You need to remember then what happened at Beth Shemesh, B E T H, second word S H E M E S H. Beth Shemesh, let me just write that down. Beth Shemesh. <clears throat> what happened at Beth Shemesh? I'm going to quickly. Tell you about the tragedy that took place there. Now the people were excited because the ark was being returned to them. It was held by the Philistines for some time. And I'm not going to get into all that story. You can read it for yourself. But the problem is, they were curious to look inside that ark. Maybe they wanted to inspect to make sure that three items that were supposed to be in the ark was there. You know what happened when that mercy seat lid came off? God killed a number of them. You can read about it in 1 Samuel. Write that down here. Chapter 6. <clears throat> what does that tell us? That he is serious about leaving those three items under the mercy seat. You think he's changed his mind since then? But yet you have predominantly preachers preaching the law still, or a mixture of law and grace. What do you think they're guilty of? Don't they realize that the letter kills? That was, was one of Paul's messages in the New Testament, in the letters that he wrote. God broke out and killed these Israelites. He killed the men of Beth Shemesh. That tells me the letter kills. If the law killed then, does it still kill today? Now, we've preached this through the Amazing Grace series. The, amp, amp, the answer is absolutely. Maybe not as quickly as it did in Beth Shemesh, but ultimately, 
you'll be just as dead because of the violation of bringing the law back into existence. Every time we try to make an attempt and every time we try to justify before God by trying to keep the Mosaic Law, what happens? It brings condemnation, friends. It is deadly. It is deadly to our spiritual bodies and possibly even physical bodies. Too many people are still trying to please God by their performance. Which is the same as trying to keep the law. It didn't work in the Old Testament. Even though they had to keep the law. <clears throat> which they couldn't. And in God's mercy, the plan they had for, he had for them, once a year that high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood to cover their sins. Mercy was applied. The law never worked, and it never will. You cannot think or try to be good enough to impress God. That's why we need Jesus. Salvation, and I've said this enough, is all about Jesus plus nothing, friends. But now, with Jesus our eternal mercy seat, we could proclaim what Paul said, Therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And I'm telling pastors out there, if you're wanting to teach the Ten Commandments, you're pushing Jesus away. You're pushing Jesus aside. You think that's a good idea? It's a horrible idea. So why don't you just preach the new covenant? So that the church of 2023, there's only one message. Let's Leave the tablets of stone where God put them and keep them under Jesus, our mercy seat. Now, I'll add more to this in the future concerning the mercy seat. This is kind of just like a summary of what it symbolizes. But the takeaway message is stop trying to expose and apply what God wanted hidden. He wanted these three items in the ark because it represented man's rejection of him. And that was not acceptable to God. So, technically, he put a lid on it. It's called the mercy seat. And now, in 2023, Jesus is our mercy seat. He puts the lid on man's rejection and sin if man trusts in his redeeming work. Nothing added to it. It's Jesus plus nothing. You got it?
you do, I want to hear from you.